I guess I'm on. So uh, my grandson Mitchell is going to, my oldest grandson who graduated from BYU is here to help me. So Mitchell, will you come up with me? Hello, BYU. Hello. So I'm so grateful to be here. It's a fantastic school. I graduated from BYU. So did my grandson Mitchell. Uh, this good looking guy next to me. And uh, he's going to help me with my, my presentation. I have a vision problem. So um, uh, if I stare at my notes closely, you know it's just because I have to see a little, a little uh, closer. I lost my vision in, in 94. I'm legally blind. Uh, I lost my eyesight when I went uh, uh, public in 1994. So that was a traumatic experience. Anyway, um, I'm grateful to be here. And you know, when I was bishop, um, I used to tell my, my, my uh, ward members that those that sat in the back were in outer darkness and invite them to come sit down closer. So uh, those of you who want to sit down where the light is, uh, you know, come forward. Uh, those who want to stay in outer darkness, you can stay where you are. So um, anyway, uh, we're taking notes as to who's in outer darkness. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dean Perry for being here uh, today and inviting me to, to come in and speak to you. So it's, it's really indeed my honor. I started lecturing here at, uh, at Entrepreneur Lecture Series back in 89 was the first time that I I lectured, so you can see it's been been a while ago that uh, that I've done. I did it for years, and then uh, people moved on and, and just forgot about me. And so uh, yeah, I've been invited back, and grateful to hear. And Jim Crowley, who's part of the the uh, fundraiser for for the church and BYU, is is also here. And so grateful for for this opportunity to once again come to uh, to BYU and be here. So uh, I'm celebrating an, an anniversary. Uh, it's not my marriage. By the way, my lovely wife, Delana, and I have been married for 54 years. We have 22 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. He has one of them. Uh, we're hoping that uh, Matt and Jesse get on the ball and, and help us uh, increase, our, uh, increase our posterity. So uh, we're, we're truly blessed uh, to be able to, um, to have such a great posterity. But the uh, anniversary I'm celebrating is that 60 years ago, I celebrated my first Thanksgiving away from home. I was barely 18, and uh, I lived in the D dorms in, in the Quonset huts, or the army barracks, that used to be, um, I don't know where located now, but over near the power part, part where they used to have the power building. Uh, and uh, I lived in dorm two. It was a, just a, a Quonset hut, an uh, army barracks. And on Thanksgiving, uh, all my roommates, we either went home or invited out to dinner. And so I was left alone. And uh, I went down to the, uh, to, the, to the cafeteria, which was a converted uh, mess hall, an army mess hall, uh, for those, right behind the Iron Science Center. It was right there. And it really looked, it was a terrible looking facility. Uh, we used to call it Tomain Hall um, because of the food wasn't that good. And, and so anyway, I went down there because I had a meal ticket, a room and board uh, at, in those days. And uh, uh, it was closed. And so uh, I may have a hard time talking about this, but I had no place to go. And so I went back and laid down on my, in my bunk in my dorm and, and played my, on my little phonograph, my 40, little 45 phonograph. I played music and cried. <laughs> that was what, that's how I celebrated my, my first Thanksgiving away from home. So I felt really lonely imagining my family enjoying their time together because I'm, I'm the oldest of 11 children. And uh, so, uh, First one to be away from home. I had no, no friends here at, at BYU. I'd only been here a few months before uh, Thanksgiving anyway. And so it was a really tough time for me. And, and, uh, and that's how I remember my, uh, my first Thanksgiving. I'm probably the oldest person that attended BYU physically on campus today. So um, I started in 1955. So I don't think anybody can say that they've been here before 1955. If you are, then I guess I'm not the oldest. but. Um, Anyway, I'm, I'm truly grateful to be able to, to be here today. And so uh, with that, let's uh, start my, uh, my lecture. I can't see what's on there. You're, you're still oh, I see. I can see it on. Yeah. Click the right. I did click the right. You got it. Where do you click it to? There you go. Thank okay. You entrepreneur. Okay. So how come this is, this is, this, the, this button is not working. So let's see. Maybe. Okay, okay, this this okay, space, space bar? bar will do it. Okay. Oh. Okay, so go back. There you go. Son of a cattle rancher. 
Okay, uh, well, this is not the one, the one I'm looking for. This, this, is, this evidently, is pres this presentation is not on here that we currently have uh, showing. Look. Tom Peters. Right, there you go. Is it there? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So Tom Peters, in pursuit of excellence, says, if you're not getting fired, you're not trying hard enough. And I can vouch for that because um, during my career, I was fired five times. In fact, what, what happens is, is that um, uh, what uh, Druck, Peter Drucker says that what, what companies want is for you to, to be creative, innovative, but at the same time be like a, a mental retard because they want you to do this, this rote job without debating it. In other words, they wanted you to follow the set procedure and, and, and not deviate from that. So um, with me, uh, because of the fact that, that I'm entrepreneurial, I didn't fit in, and so um, my boss told me that I really shouldn't work for, for anyone else, that I, that I should go out and start my own company. And, uh, and so what happens is, is that whenever you start thinking outside the box, and you guys know what the box is, right? The box is the known, and Elder Packer, in one of his talks, talks about going from the known to the unknown, and then a little bit further. And, and so to be creative, to be really on, on, the, on the bleeding edge, and and um, uh, we talked about floppy disks and, and those toward these disruptive technologies. That's what I did. In fact, mine was so disruptive that I got fired over it. Uh, but the wafer stepper, for those of you who don't know, is the, is the piece of equipment that takes the image of the, of the circuit and then and puts it and prints it on the, uh, on the wafer. And back in, in 1974, when I conceived of it, we were on very small wafers. Uh, on three inch wafers and and I can I perceived in the in the future we'd be on 12 inch uh, and so uh, uh, Today we are in 12 inch and also I, I envisioned that we'd we were in three 3,000 nanometer and I envisioned us getting down below 435 nanometers, which is a wavelength of light and so I, I conceived of that and 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 I saw the need for the for the equipment, but my, my company didn't and, and didn't really see the need of it uh, and, and so they just said, well, you know, you're obviously not fit in you, the corporate structure. You ought to go out and, and start your own company. So in 1976, I left uh, Electromask and started uh, looking around. What am I going to do? I, I went home and told my wife, I'm not going to work for anybody ever again. So from June of 1976 to this very day, I have not received a paycheck from anybody else other than myself. So I've written my own checks for, for those uh, many years. So you can imagine that that was a traumatic time for me because I had no idea what I was going to do to, for a company. I tried two or three different kinds of companies. Uh, they, they really didn't, didn't work out too well. Uh, was one of them was mentioned, the one with Jim Fix, where I invented the first runner's watch. The runner's watch was weighed, weighed one ounce. It was made of plastic. Back in those days, you know, plastic watches were not the vogue. Uh, they were metal. Uh, but it was electronic, and I had, start, I had a start, start capability. And Jim Fix, who was the, um, the marathoner in those days and very well known for his marathon capability, um, he uh, 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 enlisted with me to develop the runner's watch. And that's what it was it's called, the microcell runner's watch. And that was the very first uh, uh, lightweight watch that the runners ever, uh, ever used. Uh, <clears throat> but Casio did me in, and so I moved on to something else. I tried one thing after another. Let me see where I am here. Okay, so, so what I did is, is that, um, I don't know if I'm on the right page or not, but um, I kept trying different things and, 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 and you know, what you're gonna do, you're, you're gonna find out that not necessarily everything you try is gonna, is gonna work out. So you have to keep trying and working at it if you're going to, to succeed. So uh, in 19, 78, um, uh, serendipitously, I was over uh, buying some parts for, for my runner's watch, and this one company um, uh, was, was going, you know, they were going bankrupt, and so the, the, there was a fellow there who was uh, um, with Honeywell Aerospace down in Tampa, Florida, was trying to get all of his hardware that he had for building the circuits they needed for, for the military, and he was cussing and swearing and carrying on, and, and I asked him what his problem was, and, and, and he told me that, that, he, that mm -hmm. this company was now going bankrupt and leaving them in the lurch, and, and, uh, and I said, well, I can help you, 
And he said, well, how? And I said, well, give me your tooling and I'll go out and make this product for you. And I had no idea how I was going to do it. I just, he just, just, it was back in 1976, or uh, early 77. And, he's, and, and uh, he said, well, how are you going to do it? And I said, don't worry about it. Just give me the tooling and, 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 I'll, and I'll go out and do it. And so as it turned out, uh, you know, he, he had no other choice. So he, he, here I am, one person. He hands me this huge box of stuff, put it in my car, and I went home and I got a hold of a few friends. And want, anybody want to help me? Kind of like the little red hen story, you know, who wants to help me clean the field? Who wants to help me, you know, make this bread? And uh, I only had one fellow that was willing to help me who ultimately became my partner. Uh, so we started out at d doing this subcontracting. I, I got one part made over here, this other part's made over there. I just kind of went around the valley um, uh, getting different companies to help me to build a product. And, uh, and so we were able to be successful. We were nominated as a top 10 supplier of the, of the year uh, by Honeywell Aerospace in 1977. I still have that plaque in my home. So after the first year, we were still, uh, we became the top 10 supplier of Honeywell. So they wanted to present us with a plaque. And, and so uh, they called and the you know, corporate from Clearwater, Florida called and said, uh, we'd like to present it to your company. And so I said, well, uh, just a minute. And I called Warren because, you know, he, at home, and I said, your house or mine, you know, because we were working out of our houses. So uh, uh, they didn't have, they had no idea that we were building these products, actually not using our own production facilities. We were actually subcontracting with different facilities to make, the, to make those products. So um, let's see, where am I in on my... Yeah, let's see. Let me advance this. It looks like the printed slides are... Different. Quite a bit different than what's up on here. This okay. It says what I believe after 37 years of leadership, but like this Peter Drucker quote. Okay. So I did, my, my slides don't match what we have on here, so we're going to have to go with what I have here in writing because I can't see what's on there anyway. So let's go to this, go to Peter Drucker's slide. Okay. Let's see. Like, see, now you're going to brain, eyes, heart. No, that's the. Yeah. It's, we I got the wrong one up. Have, I don't think you have Peter Drucker on this. Okay. You don't have it. I'll read it for you, though. Okay. Okay. So as he says, Peter Drucker said, the entrepreneur always searches for change, responds to it, and exploits it as an opportunity. So here, so that's what, what, what you, what you're, if you're an entrepreneur, you're looking for change. You're looking for something different. Like, for example, when I, when I told this fellow that I would take his box of parts and I would go get them made, that was a change. He was, he was now having to go from, from a, a, a really true manufacturing facility to someone who said, I can do it, and, and who just took this box of parts and then figure out how, how we were going to do it. Uh, and, and, and so when I created the wafer stepper, the same thing. I was looking for change, and I exploited that change. And that's how we, we uh, um, began to start the company. So in, in November of 1978, I founded my Krell. So we first we what we started the company first is uh, uh, I needed to get some funding by the way in order to, to start the company, uh, and and so what I did is I went to the bank and I said I'd like to borrow some money and they said we don't we don't loan to startups, and they said you you know you have to go to venture capitalists if you want to do a startup. And, and I said, well, I don't want to go to a venture capitalist because I want to own the company. Uh, and, and I don't want to have to be on constantly trying to raise money. I want to be able to, to fund it and then run it. And so the bank said, no, we're, we're not going to fund you. Uh, and, but then I, I came up with an idea of how I could get them to fund me by saying, well, tell me, even though you don't want to fund me, tell me what it would take if you were to fund me. And they said, why? It's a waste of time. I said. Well, I'd like to learn, so if you won't mind teaching me what it would take to get the bank to fund me to, to, to run this company. And so they, they listed all these, these onerous um, uh, uh, covenants that said, you know, you, you had the you know, debt to equity, you know, you had to, have, you had to be you know, one to one, and, and uh, you, or four to one, sorry, no, one, one to four, uh, and, and you, had to have, you had to be profitable every year, um, every quarter. And they had this litany of, of, of all these uh, covenants that I had to meet. And, and so I said, uh, OK. And I agreed to them. And the bank said, oh, 
well, you just said you wanted to learn. I said, well, I agreed to him. I, I signed it. And I said, here, I agreed to him. And I hand it back to him. They said, oh, well, uh, you can't meet these covenants. You're, you'll fail. And I said, well, why would you want me to fail? Well, we don't want you to fail. And I said, okay, let's, let's, let's create covenants that I can meet. And so we went back and forth. And, and they said, well, how is it that now we, we're, we're committed to, to, to have to fund you? I said, because I, we, we both agreed to the covenants that I would meet. And, and so what actually ended up happening was is that I conned them into to giving me a loan when they didn't even know it. And so uh, they, they loaned me $300,000. I put up the other $300,000 with a couple of other uh, uh, of my uh, partners. And we had to personally guarantee the debts of the company. So at one time, I had to guarantee up to four and a half million dollars of debts to the company, which was a million and a half more than I had in net worth. And so it was, it was a pretty scary time. But that's what you have to do. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to put yourself at risk. So now we're to the next. Uh... Okay, so cha change is always with us. There, we, no matter how long you're going to be in business, change is going to be with you. And, and, and we went through, in 37 years, we went through five different cycles. And so what a, what a cycle is, is, is that a cycle in our industry, in high tech, is about five years. So when you do, um, when you figure out, okay, I'm, I'm looking ahead and I'm going to try to anticipate the next business cycle, and if it takes you two, two or three years to develop the product, you're only going to have two or three years in order to, to, to benefit from that product. So that means you have to think ahead of the, of the next cycle. So you have to be ahead at least two to three years ahead of when the cycle actually starts because you only have five years to, to, to benefit from that, from that cycle. So that's what I'm talking about when you've got to go from the known to the unknown and then further. So trying to anticipate the cycle is, is the difficult part. And, and so uh, because of my experience, uh, and, and in the business, I could see where the next cycle was going. And that helped me as I now tried to fund the company for the next, for the next business cycle. So we went through five cycles in, in seven year, in 37 years, which is really quite, quite a feat. Uh, so, you know, what, what it takes is that you really have to have the, the vision the, and the forethought about how you're going to um, to uh, uh, run your company because you're going to be faced with these with these business cycles. 80% of all companies fail because their their business plans are, are, are flawed. So you have to have a in order to have a plan, you have to have a goal. So you have to set the goal and then you develop the plan to accomplish the goal. And I'll get more into that in a, in a minute. I'm sorry my slides aren't co uh, cooperating with uh, with my presentation. It's not your fault. It's probably my fault for sending you the wrong one. So, Colin okay. Powell quote. Okay. Uh, Colin Powell says, there are no secrets to success. It is a result of preparation, hard work, and learning from failure. So, <clears throat> we all make mistakes. There's not one of us in here that doesn't make mistakes. As, as Paul says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, we all make mistakes. So a mistake is really not a mistake as long as we're willing to correct it. And so what we, what we think about, if, if they say no harm, no foul, is that if you make a mistake and then you fix it and nobody's harmed from it, you really haven't made a mistake. That's how we perfect ourselves. That's why you be there, be there for perfect, even as your Father in Heaven is perfect. We grow through overcoming these trials and obstacles. So again, a mistake is really not a mistake if you correct it. But you have to be willing to do that. That's the, the challenge is, is that the, whatever the outcome of that mistake is, as long as it doesn't harm the person or the outcome, then the mistake is really not, a, a, not relevant. So again, don't be afraid to, uh, to make a mistake. Uh, in fact, you know, the, 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 the first thing that happens when, when you think about um, uh, trying to to, to repent or overcome a mistake. And the thing that stops most people from, from doing the four steps is they're not willing to, the, to admit they made a mistake. And the reason they're willing, they don't want to admit they, 
made a mistake is because they think of themselves as that if I made a made a mistake, then I did something wrong. We don't like to admit that we did something wrong, so we try to alibi our, our way out of it. So the first thing you need to do if you really want to change is you have to admit that you're vulnerable, that you do, you're fallible, and you do make mistakes. The second thing is that you have to be willing to do is then to admit it. You have to go out and say to somebody, I'm sorry, I made this mistake. And you know what the third one is? Anybody know? Okay, what's the, what's the, four, what's the third thing you have to do? You've, you, you've acknowledged it to yourself, you've, you've, you've confessed it. What's the, th what's the third? You have to make amends. In other words, you have to overcome the mistake that you made. You have to, you have to make reparations somehow. And then what's the fourth one? Don't do it again. Don't repeat it. He who repeats the past fails in the future. So don't keep making the mistake. Once, you, once, you've, made, once you've made that mistake, you have to commit to yourself that you're not going to make that one again. And you have to prepare for that. Okay, so where are we here? Yeah, so... Um, my, my dad told me that, you know, the necessity is, uh, is the mother of invention. You've all heard that saying, but he said, it's not just invention, it also comes through inspiration. So you have to have invention plus inspiration. So mine, mine came out of necessity because I lost my job, I had to go do something. And so that, as a consequence of that, uh, I said, okay, now I need to understand what I'm, what I'm going to do. And to do that, I relied on inspiration. I had the support of my wife, the support of my friends, but I still had to have it confirmed to me that that which I was doing was correct. And that's, that's when I went on my, hands, on my knees to my Father in Heaven and said, this is what I want to do, what do you think? And, and so then I got that confirmation that what I, what I should do uh, was to start my Krell and, and as a consequence of that, I did receive the inspiration that I needed. I think it's where I am. Okay. Sarah Lacey. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So Sarah Lacey says, the biggest barrier to starting a company isn't ideas, funding, or experience. It's excuses. Do you think about that? It's excuses. What we do is we, rather than admit that we did something wrong, we just come up with an excuse for it. So an excuse is just a reason wrapped around nonsense. So it, it, what we do in, in, in effect is offer ourselves an out. You don't want to do that. You have to say, like, like Peter said uh, to the Savior when in the upper room, when, when the Savior said, one of you is going to betray me, Peter said, is it I? We have to be willing to, to accept personal responsibility for the decision that we make. And, and oftentimes we want to blame others. We want to offer excuses for that. And that's, and that's uh, one of the failure mechanisms that I see with companies that are trying to uh, get started. Is, and the reason they fail is because they offer these reasons or these excuses for their, for their failure. Um, so I started my Krell with $300,000 in 1978. Um, I put up, an, uh, I got a bank loan for $300,000. Uh, and we were able to, to, to run profitably every single quarter for the first year. Uh, and as, as was mentioned earlier, that my company only lost money on a gap basis one year, and that was in 2002. We had to consolidate two facilities into one because, again, the business almost fell in half with the dot-com implosion. And as a consequence of that, we closed down a facility, wrote off $29 million, but I only lost $50,000 on a gap basis. So the total loss that my company has seen in 37 years is $50,000 on, on a gap basis. Um, so in, 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 um, in August of this year, in 2015, because the, uh, the, uh, the board directors wanted to, with pressure from uh, from activist shareholders, they wanted to see what the company was worth on the outside market. As a consequence of that, we ended up selling the company in August of 2015 for $840 million. So we took the company from $300,000 to $840 million 
in, in 2015. That's a return of 2,800%. Uh, That's a record in our industry. That's the ROI that, that, that we achieved. And we had uh, 5,000 products and over 10,000 customers. We sold worldwide uh, uh, in our industry. So, um, go ahead. Yep, next one. Okay. This quote is from Albert Schweitzer. He says, one who gains strength by overcoming obstacles possesses the only strength which can overcome adversity. Think about that. Adversity is like manure. It stinks, but it helps us grow. So we want, if, if, so if you have that power, that ability to overcome an obstacle, you have the power to deal with adversity. You're not going to get away from adversity. Adversity is going to be with you. You're, none of us are going to, to be um, uh, absolved from, from adversity. So don't worry about it. I used to tell my, uh, my high priest group leader when I was bishop, and he was my, also my home teacher, and I used to tell him, pray for problems. He says, are you nuts, bishop? Why Problems are going to come when we pray for them or not. And I says, yes, but call, pray for a few extra ones because you're going to learn from that. And Norm used to shake his head as he logged in. He says, I hate coming home teaching here because I, I have enough problems about praying for him, Bishop. But anyway, the, the net of it is praying for problems is not bad. Heavenly Father would appreciate it because what does he do? He gives us problems so that we overcome our weaknesses. That's how we become strong, is through overcoming adversity. We're not going to overcome it if we're kept in the Garden of Eden. Hopefully, going, I know BYU looks like the Garden of Eden to you, with all these beautiful girls and so forth, but the Garden of Eden is not here in mortality. You are going to have to work, as, as the Lord told the, the, the Adam, all the days of your life. And that's why I've worked as long as I have, because I took that literally. And I'm still working. I'm working harder now that I'm retired than before I was retired. So, again, don't be afraid of, of work. Got, uh, 18 okay. 18 um, excuse me for having to read because of my presentation. Okay. Um, we all know what traction is. You have to have the power to, to start. That's the traction. But if you, if, you, if you don't have the power to, to continue, then you don't have traction. So you have to have both. So when we talk about traction, we're talking about the power to start and the power to continue. And that's the, the advantage that, that we in the church have because we understand this eternal principle of, of having enduring to the end. So you know, just getting started isn't enough. I liken it to, for example, some of these companies that you see out here are like fireworks. They go up, they, 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 they shower, look, they look great, look, but they fizzle out. Okay, so what, what, what you want to be is like a hoist. A hoist can sustain great loads for long periods of time, but nobody goes down to the service station to watch them lift a the car up. Why? Because it doesn't look glamorous, but that's what you want to do. You want to focus on being able to lift great loads and sustain it. Don't be just fireworks. Don't be just, oh, that sounds like a good thing. I'll go out and do that. Because it fizzles out. You, what you want to do is like when you prepare a, a talk. What do you, how do you prepare a talk? You first of all have to look at what is the message. What's the conclusion? What message do I want to send? Then you develop the talk to support that conclusion. So when you start your company, you want to have, okay, what... What do I want this company to accomplish? What's my goal? What's my end game? What do we, what do we want to do? Then you should develop the, the business plan or the strategy to accomplish it. Some of you, by the way, are, are part of this e-business or what's it called, e-club, or I think you referred to it. I just, by the way, my, uh, I was doing a press release uh, yesterday. A press release went out where uh, Ray Zen Entrepreneur, Tough Things First, is now doing we're having our own funding program, our, our venture fund, where we're doing mentoring to, to help new, new uh, startups to, to get going. Uh, and that was just a press release went out yesterday on that. So uh, I, I can relate to what you're talking about. Um, so again, you, you, when, you, when those of you who are working on your, 
on, on your uh, business plan, on your, on your business idea, have an end game. What is it you want to accomplish? And once you decide that, then develop the business case to support that. Now, a lot of companies focus a lot on just on, on, on revenue. Revenue it does not earn, is not earnings. You want to focus on earnings. Earnings is what keeps your company going. Let's see where I am. Steve Jobs quote. Okay. Okay, this quote is from Steve Jobs. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And so, you know, Confucius said, and I'm going to go to that slide. Yeah, there it is. So Confucius says, choose a job you love, and you will never have to work a day in your life. So make sure whatever it is, venture you're going, is that you love it. That that is something that you really um, want to uh, to endure with, because if you don't like what you're doing, you're not going to you're not going to stick with it. So again, focus on 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 the kind of company that that you believe is going to be enduring, and and focus on earnings and not on revenue. So if anything that you learn today is Focusing on, on, on earnings. Um, I did, okay. Okay. Oh, <laughs> do you want to do this one? It's your quote. Go ahead, say it. Okay. <laughs> Grandpa says, cash is king. That's my saying. So if you ever hear that, you know it came from me. <laughs> no company went out of business when they had cash. So, again, if you focus on earnings, you will always have cash. You have to have enough runway to continue. And I have a, 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 a policy, a business policy, and, and, and if I get involved with any of you and your businesses, I want you to make sure that you have at least one quarter's worth of cash to cover you for the next quarter. So, in other words, you have to have the ability to, to sustain yourself for six months. And so what you do is you never, make, you never let your expenses increase greater than the prior quarter, even if your revenue is going up. Why? Because the revenue may go down in the following quarter. So make sure that your revenue is sustainable so that when you do grow your expenses, that you can cover them. Cash is king. If you've learned anything today, remember, Brother Zen said cash is king. You can't go out of business if you have cash. Okay, we covered that. Entrepreneurship is a marathon. Okay, entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So you have to pace yourself. If you if you go too fast in the beginning, you're not going to cover the 26.1 miles. It just won't happen. So you have to pace yourself, knowing how far you have to go. If you don't understand your business. Don't go into it. So you have to look at the, look at the, the companies that, that, that are comparable to you. Do the research. Do the, 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 the case studies of the companies uh, in your similar business. If you don't have the experience, you're not going to succeed. So make sure you have the ability to extend your runway. And to do that means that your plan has to be one that, that incorporates the cycles changes that we talked about the ability to, to sustain yourself from quarter after quarter and make sure that whatever business venture you go into is profitable. So, I, you know, businesses that are not profitable, I, I call, they're not, they're not worth it. They're not really companies. So again, remember, you, you, the goal that you have is that your business to be sustainable has to be based on earnings. Mike Krell, um, for the past uh, 20 years, has paid a dividend, has bought back stock. We've returned over 100% of our free cash flow back to our investors. Investors like that, and they, and they, stick, they stay with you if, if, in fact, you will do that for them. So whoever your investors are, and you, some of them might be family, some might be angels, but remember, they're going to look for a return. And if you don't show them how they're going to get a return, you're going to be like in the shark tank, you know, that that uh, Mr. Wonderful, you know, he, 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 you can see 
By the way, these are smart guys that are on Shark Tank. And, and the reason they're smart is because they've been through the things that we've talked about. Uh, and, they, and they understand that your, that your business plan has to be sustainable. So if you don't want, if you don't want them to say, I'm out, and, that, and that's what I will do if, if I get involved with you, if you don't have a plan that, that makes sense to me, I'll just say, okay, I'm out. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of the, 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 the concluding remark. The, if, if they say, okay, I'm willing, willing to do this for this percentage of the business, then, then they're in. Uh, but remember, you can't be greedy. You've got to be willing to share the wealth because you're not going to get investors to join you in your venture if you don't show them that, that they're going to get there's some return for them. Now, um, when I started my Corral in 78, we didn't go public until 1994. So we were you know, 16 years before we went public. And the reason for that was is that I wasn't ready to go public. Now, why did I go public? Because that was a natural thing I wanted to accomplish. It was one of the goals I set was I'd like to become a public company. And so to be a public company, of course, you, you run the risk. You have, you have all these outside investors that are going to be expecting you to perform. And, and that's, that's another key. That's why I wanted those uh, to be, why, why I wanted to be a public company was so that I would have that pressure on me to perform you know, quarter after quarter. So, um, brothers and sisters, this is a, a great opportunity for you. I'm glad that you were able to, to be here today to, I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I still got a few minutes. Um, I, I know that um, you're at one of the best universities in the world uh, and you got some of the best teachers that I know on earth. Um, I got my education here. I know that, um, that if you uh, apply the principles of the gospel in your, in your business, and, and when I told my people that, uh, that I was hiring, I said, I'm not going to make you rich. That's your job. I'm here to help you become a better person. A better person becomes a better employee. How? A better father, mother, husband, wife, citizen. So my goal, I told my people, is to help you become a better person. And I hope that part of the, the institution that you're getting here is to help you become a better person, not just a smart uh, student. So, you know, if you're a better husband, better wife, you know, citizen, whatever you, you can be, if you learn to do that while you're here, that'll help you as you now go out into the business world. Because that's why people want to hire, uh, companies want to hire students from BYU, is because you guys are better people, period. And, and that's the, the, the key to, uh, to, to your success, is to be that kind of person. So when I was running uh, my Krell, uh, I can truly tell you that I would not have minded as the Savior to walk in to my building at any time, because the, he, he, what he would find, in my mind, would be the gospel principles lived to, to their fullest. You know, and, and so, and don't be afraid to, to ask Heavenly Father for, for, for guidance and direction when you hire people, when you decide about a business change, make it part of your, 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 your principle is to go in and, and, and seek guidance from him. Um, it, so we had four, four principles at Mike Krell. The culture of the company was honesty, integrity. Integrity is doing what's right when nobody's watching. Dignity of every individual, we allowed no swearing. So at Mike Krell, even though we had hardly any LDS at workforce. There was no swearing allowed at the company, and that we were known for. And the fourth was do whatever it takes, no, no excuses. So again, it goes back to the mistake thing. If you make a mistake, be willing to correct it. Do whatever it takes, no excuses. And that's the key to, uh, to having the, the best culture of your company, honesty, integrity, dignity of every individual, and doing whatever it takes. So. Thank you, and I appreciate this opportunity to come speak to you today.